here at City Labs is running this idea challenge, which will be addressed in detail uh, by Matteo uh, later on. And so the idea was to introduce you a little bit what is EIT ICT Labs doing, how is EIT ICT Labs supporting uh, startup uh, activities, spin off activities, uh, entrepreneurial activities, and this is my role. I'm working as a business uh, developer for the Business Accelerator team uh, of EIT ICT Labs. And let's begin with EIT ICT Labs itself. EIT stands for European Institute of Innovation of, and Technology. Uh, ICT you know, and uh, the basic mission is, uh, let's say, twofold. On the one hand, uh, collaborative uh, development projects are support. So the focus is not as in uh, former FP7 projects from the EU, the research and development. The focus is big D development and innovation, so the orientation to the market. And therefore, EIT, ICT Labs is funding uh, collaborative projects and so-called high impact initiatives. And on the other hand, EIT, ICT Labs is supporting startup activities. Therefore, we have the business development accelerators and the business development accelerators offer a lot of services to help startups getting access to customers and getting access to finance. And this is what I can detail a little bit. Is my presentation up? Not yet. Okay. Shall we go ahead? No? Okay, I skip a few slides in order to be short. So what we basically do is basically we, we bridge the gap yeah, between idea and market. Uh, many ideas are being developed in the scientific systems, uh, in the heads of uh, young entrepreneurs, but most of the ideas somehow end in the valley of death. And the reason is that uh, if you look at the idea, uh, in order to get it to the market, you, you have, to do, have to have a product at the end, you have to have a service at the end, and not just an idea. So more or less you're looking at the top of an iceberg. And you, don't, you have to look under the water to see what you also need. You need product development. You need to, to, not to only to offer your product or your service, you have to think about maintenance, first level support, second level support. In order to get it out to the market, you have to talk about marketing strategy. You have to talk about uh, market analysis. Who are your customers? Why are your customers in the future paying for you? And so on and so on. You need to talk about patent protection. So you need a lot of additional services, not only money to develop the prototype into a final product. And these services are being offered uh, by accelerators, incubators, and also by the business development accelerator of EIT ICT Labs. Uh, the business development accelerator create a business community. And uh, by helping spin-offs into the business community, we create the value of the spin-offs and startup needs in order to be successful. And this on the global level. Basically, uh, there is a first assessment which kind of spin-off uh, we support. And uh, the spin-off has to have a high impact, economic impact. Uh, the spin-off has to have a high growth potential. And the spin-off has, has to have a high fit. It has to fit to the action lines of the IT activities. And the action lines define the uh, specialization uh, within the ICT sector. There are eight action lines, uh, which are future cloud systems, health and well-being, uh, urban life and mobility, and so on and so on. And security, privacy, security, and trust is one of the action lines. The business development accelerators support the strategic coaching. <coughs> We even offer office space, incubation space, we offer a lot of training services, we offer access to finances, preparation of pitches, preparation of meeting investors, how to present your idea to investors, and then the meeting with the investor itself. We offer access to market and we offer access to other technologies. Access to other technologies, for example, to research communities. Uh, or to companies which have big technology portfolio. So we run a so-called funnel. We have a radar of companies uh, that we find interest in, interesting or that companies that uh, approach us to get access to all services. As soon as we see the value, as soon as we see the fit, we 
coach them, scout them, coach them, and try to generate the value. And the way we get companies a two-hour radar, for example, is an idea challenge. Now we have a big participation in such challenges, and this gives us the opportunity to evaluate an idea and to see if an entrepreneur sees high potential, if our experts see high potential in the idea, and if uh, this is worthwhile to approach it further into the market, into financing. And um, to help into the market or into financing, we build the business community, we build an economic uh, community, we build an uh, innovative ecosystems, and we work close with the development and innovation activities also managed and run by ERT ICT labs. And you see there's a lot of interaction, so that we really create value by building this business community. And here's some of the measures that are offered to startup companies. Uh, we organize startup meet investors, high-level investor pitches uh, with pitch trainings with startups can all visit for free. Uh, we organize idea challenges, which will be introduced to you later, especially now the one that is open for privacy, uh, security, and trust. Um, we offer uh, activities in which uh, entrepreneurs can share results, for example, with a big community, with big companies in the market, so that they get, get access to the big fishes. Uh, we uh, build startup communities, especially with those, those uh, large companies. Maybe Siemens in the security area, also a very important player from Germany. Siemens runs the technology business accelerator, the funding program. And they invest money if the technology fits to their own business line, if the technology fits to the Siemens business units. And we directly communicate with this technology business uh, intake and program in order to help company to get access to the decision makers at Siemens. And this is not only in a phone call, it's also by organized uh, events, by organized meetings to which, uh, for which the startup companies can qualify. And uh, we have uh, proposals for networking, and in this networking we bring together research units, startups, SMEs, into large companies in development projects. And this development projects again develop new results, products, and have and help to add, to add value to the activities of startup companies in spin-off organizations. This is a list of players which are who are all involved in the IT ICT labs. Uh, you see this is a, a big mix of uh, research organizations and uh, really significant companies in Europe, like Siemens in Germany, the telecoms of this world, like Nokia, like Philips, like Intel. These are also the big research organizations, like India, like Fraunhofer, uh, and uh, famous universities. This all is the community of EICT and Philips. And <clears throat> with this community, we support the success to market, we support startups to get into the market as easy and as smooth as possible. But there's also access to finance program. So as soon as we support the business plan development of the company, as soon as we support the business modeling, we offer qualification events, seminars, educational events, and help pitch training in order to let start entrepreneurs meet investors at the right time and to, to get the right kind of money into the company fine kind of money, some companies need business angel early investment, we see early stage investment or really mature investment uh, of a significant amount, uh, really a serious uh, stage uh, and uh, we prepare the companies for all, for all kinds of this investment deal. Uh, you see the business community that we build, there's a specialized group access to finance, they make the connections to the investors, uh, they uh, make sure that the deals are prepared for the investment and then uh, we as business developers introduce deals to the investors in the final stage and you see the big investor, investor network which is built all around the nodes of the IT ICT labs. 
So the nodes are in <coughs> Finland, Helsinki, and Sweden, Stockholm, Eindhoven, the Netherlands, Germany, Berlin, uh, in Trento, in Italy, in Budapest, in Hungary, in Paris, in, in France, in London, uh, in the UK, and in Madrid, in Spain. And uh, we start now outreach programs, for example, from uh, Budapest into Romania, into Bulgaria, and into the Balkans. This closes briefly the presentation, this links to the idea challenge, which is an important element, as you uh, understand now, of our activities, and uh, this leads to the introduction. Okay, uh, thank you, Wolfgang. Um, the next speaker, Matteo, would you care to expand on the idea challenge now? Or? I can do it in the end if you prefer. Okay. So we can go to the we'll topic and it. then see from it. So just to say who am I, so when you. So uh, I'm one of the partners that you see on the big list of logos that you see there from the Italian note of the European Institute of Technology. And I'm in charge of the communication. I'm a communication manager and accelerator uh, within the European Institute of Technology called TechPix. Probably some of you have heard of it. And uh, we, we did some events already with TechUp. And uh, we are running uh, specifically the idea challenge of privacy, security, and trust. So at the end, when we're going to dig into the topic, I'm going to introduce what it is so you can ask me questions on how to enter this funnel of business opportunities that uh, Wolfgang presented to you. So this is the entrance point. Okay. okay thank you. So working for a security company uh, in Romania, but a Danish company, Alin Vlad. Okay, yeah, my name is Arim Blatt. Currently, I'm working as a director of online service and marketing for a Danish security startup uh, called Heimar Security. We do our product, does advanced financial malware scanning, uh, software patching, and things like that. We're complementary to, to an antivirus, to a classic antivirus. And my previous experience was in Bitdefender for two years and a half, I think where I worked in the marketing department and before I worked for another Danish security startup called Burgard that turned on device, classic device. Okay. Uh, Robert Knapp, yes. share some things about you. Uh, my name is Robert Knapp. Uh, I'm from, uh, from Germany. I'm here in Bucharest since a couple of years. Um, yeah, my story is I'm, I'm an entrepreneur since I, I don't know, 16, 17, 18, started to run my own companies from music to fashion to software publishing, um, ending up here um, a couple of years ago in Bucharest. I founded a, a security startup that runs uh, privacy as a service. Um, until then, I didn't know uh, a lot about uh, the security industry and I didn't know a lot about the internet. So um, <clears throat> again, I learned everything from my own uh, mistakes with a, a very cool team here. Um, and we built a company called uh, CyberGhost VPN. So we are running a, a security cloud with more than 400 servers all over the world that delivers an encrypted access to the internet and another IP address which makes you anonymous. So that's why we call us uh, ourselves as a privacy as a service company. So we offer privacy and security online. Okay, so I just open with some questions. And uh, the first question would be, what are the uh, specific challenges in developing security startups and products? I think the first the first challenge um, um, we, we faced was if you build a, a security startup or if you build a security product, you have to be aware of the fact that you can't build a security product because you can't offer 100% security. So you just can build something that is, that is a solution for an existing problem. So, and um, if you start to build this, this, this product, it's, it's not enough to build just the, the product, you have to build the company culture. You can't run a security company or security product without a company culture that is focused on being a security company. It starts with uh, uh, the people you have on your payroll, it, it ends up with uh, uh, password management, with internal processes. Every contract you sign has to be uh, uh, negotiated under the term of uh, does it fit to our own compliance rules. So what we had to learn here as we started to the company, so we had we had a we had a prototype or we had a product, uh, we had traction, so people wanted to use this product, but then we found out that you know we don't have to focus uh, just on the on the on the product itself and to develop it. Uh, we had to focus on building a company culture and we had to choose for the right partners. And um, 
that is kind of kind of tricky because everything you, you hear about MVPs, so 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 starting starting low and then developing doesn't necessarily fit to a security product because you simply can't fail. I mean, you, you don't offer something that, that that should protect people and and then they'll go into a, 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 to, a total mess. And that was kind of challenging, but I mean, we managed it, so we we, we still work very very lean. Um, we roll out our technology um, um, very soft. <clears throat> and we build a company culture. So what we don't do is right now hiring fast. So we are, I mean, we are we are, we are profitable. We but can you tell us a few numbers about CyberGhost? <clears throat> yeah, we right now have three million uh, users. We are running um, 700,000 active users a day in our in our service. <clears throat> and um, our revenue this year might be about two to three million euros. Um, as I said, we are <clears throat> we are profitable. And uh, yeah, that's the size we made. How many people do you have in your company? Uh, 30. Right now. So, any other challenges you, you see in building or even communicating security products? Exactly. The, the first challenge is to to find the need. So basically, when you start, when you have the idea, not basically the not the startup, is to is you need to be sure that you're going to fulfill a need. On the, in the market, uh, because, uh, for example, Handa Security fulfills a need uh, by being complementary to an antivirus. Currently, the problem is that the antivirus cannot fully protect you, taking into consideration the the, the advanced malware that's out there, um, and we come up as a second layer of security. Uh, and the other, um, so basically, you should fulfill a need. You should find it. Not, not necessarily the, the need shouldn't be communicated by the by the customer or, or by a potential client. You should find the right context. Um, uh, for another example, um, last in May, API had a big operation taking down the. I think the crypto locker and Zeus game over servers. Uh, those are uh, those are our servers that were acting as, acting as a command and center servers for delivering malware out there. And we saw this opportunity. Uh, my CEO contacted them, and we give we gave away our intelligence to help them out. The operation was a success for that uh, in that period. Later on the those that the other servers appeared online and things like that. But uh, you need to to find the right context to to deliver to profit uh, on it. Um, I think that's it. <coughs> so I have I have an, an, another interesting thing. I mean the, the, this is how we started and then you, you face the technical challenge. The technical challenge in our day to, to build a security product. I mean we're talking about internet security. Or, or, or security that is kind of delivered with the, uh, through the internet. <clears throat> the problem we face today is that the internet is broken. I mean, this, this whole thing people built a couple of years ago doesn't work anymore. And you, 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 you can't build something that is secure on a, on, on, on a, on a basics of a, of a broken technology. Um, and, and it's broken in several ways. It's technically broken, it's politically broken. I mean, we're living in times of mass surveillance. Uh, uh, last year it popped up that the NSA is building uh, like a Google Earth of the internet, uh, they call it treasure map, and their treasure map is like they are building a map of all devices that are connected through the internet with the possibility to directly access it. So if I'm online with my phone and I'm connected to Google Earth, they can simply just access the phone through Heimdall. That's a program they run since a couple of years. Um, zero uh, zero data exploits, for example. I mean, they're, 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 you can't defend yourself against something like that, but you, it's even harder for you. If these zero exploit, the, the days exploits are, are ending up at the NSA, which is a state or a, a, a agency, or ending up on other governments, and they don't use it to protect us by telling uh, to Microsoft that there's a backdoor, they use it to survey us. That means it's that we have a political problem. Next problem is they they attack technology in a way that they try to access companies and force them to build back. That means, for example, in encryption technology. Encryption technology is a, is a nice and, and, and good technology. I mean, you need millions of computers or thousands of computers to break down an encrypted file. 
but not if somebody forces you to put a band on it. So what they do at the moment, or what happens at the moment, is we take brilliant technology and make them weak by purpose. So And, and, and knowing these, um, you have to build a security code based on that. So that means at the end of the day, um, you have to build everything from the scratch. So that's that's what CyberGhost is doing. I mean, what other people think we do is building a VPN product or a privacy and service product. What we really do is we are rebuilding uh, the internet. We are trying to reboot the internet. So we are trying to build a technical infrastructure that is end-to-end -end encrypted without that anyone can have access to, to, to our service or our technology. And this is kind of a challenge for 30 people, even if you have 3 million euro revenue. Okay. Uh, would you care to pitch in on the challenges, specific challenges for developing security products? So, Volkan, you had some very interesting ideas. Yeah, I think there are, there are several. Um, first of all, you have to distinguish is it uh, business to, to customer or is it uh, business to business? And uh, we saw, especially in the business to business area, many, many obstacles uh, caused by very long acquisition cycles. Uh, the market is a very controlled market in the business to business market. And there are the big players who either try to get access to it easily for cheap money, this is what you don't want to afford, yeah, or they try to keep you out of the market for a long time. And this causes a big acquisition cycle. You have to be visible, you have to convince them, you have to have this trusted environment to do business with them, and so on and so on. So you will uh, go to many, many fairs, to exhibitions, to have many, many meetings. And I saw many, many entrepreneurs coming up, uh, smiling out of acquisition meetings. Yeah, now we made it. And then they started the communication. And there was another request by the big customer, another request, and so on and so on. So they really keep you going. <coughs> uh, the second big obstacle in the market, I think, is the market, the security market is also controlled by the government. The government is one of the biggest customers. And there you face big uh, procurement processes. The government buys by the government has to tender. And this is all governed again by regulations. And there is not just free and uh, nomination of the customer. This, there are big, big procurement processes behind it. I saw many security companies which offer passport protection, document protection. We all have to go through this government process. And again, it takes a long time, it's a long acquisition cycle. And the third big obstacle which we faced, I started one of the first uh, internet security companies, or I helped them in 1995. And uh, our idea was, let's go to the US market first, it's much bigger than the European market. And we brought them to the US market. We started the first legal entity in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, between North Boston and New York. And uh, when the first product was out, it took a long time before, when finally the product was out, we ran directly into Digimark. It's one of the big players in the US market. And they have one business line which is called IP protection. They have their <coughs> own patents in this business line and they're doing nothing else than just claiming other people out of the market. You come there with your product, you say, oh, Google watermarking technology, European PCT, patent uh, application pending, and so on and so on. And then they have some very old, I would now say stone old algorithms even protected. They always refer your product, your software, your algorithm to their stone old algorithm. And even if you start negotiating with them, arguing with them, they will take you to court. This is their business. And as a startup company, you never have the brief, you never have the money to go into court against them. So we failed. We took the product out of the, the US market. At that moment, it was our luck. We brought it back to Europe. We started the company in Essen in Germany. Where this company was three years later bought by Thomson and was a big, big success. But this is an obstacle, yeah, IP, pattern protection. OK. So uh, going forward, uh, many viable products usually when we speak about startups and products, we need the users to get engaged as early on as possible. But as Robert mentioned, is not the case in many of the security startups. So how do you get user testing for your security products? What are the what is a workaround? 
<clears throat> I mean, we, we, we simply, um, as we started, uh, we had a lot of talks about that. <clears throat> you can't just roll out a, a security product and write beta on it and, and tell people, look, it might not work. Um, that, that's shitty, you, you don't get, get traction on it. So what, what we did was um, a look, looking on, on, on existing uh, processes uh, uh, from the industry. And we said, okay, there are existing processes, let's follow them. <clears throat> and we started with a very, very small team to go through the ISO 2701 process, ISO 901 process, and certify the whole company, all the processes. That was a mess. And then we said, okay, let's certify the product itself. And we went to the German TÜV. That was horrible. Because these guys are really seriously looking. I mean, they don't come and ask you how much money that they spend. They had really look into the pro product, and that helped a lot at the beginning. So, so we had an MVP, so we had something that we wanted to roll out, but we have, we've not been sure that it that it really works. We had user testing and everything, so we had some some, some kind of traction. And I said, okay, now we really started and rolled it out. So we went through certi certification processes, and we never stopped that. So we are in constant processes of certifications in our company. We're really looking for companies who can test us, who can challenge us, um, and, and that helped a lot. And we found a lot of bugs and mistakes. We changed internal processes. And that's, I think, how you have to roll out a, a security process at the end of the day. Uh, also knowing you know, that, that all of these processes don't, don't fit 100% to us, because we are building kind of a new technology. So we are, I, I always say we are security company 2.0 because uh, we talk here about privacy and security and, and, and stuff like that. There are other processes needed that the traditional old industry can, can deliver, but you can still learn a lot from them and from their processes. Sure. I have nothing as that it is. <laughs> and, uh, how do you get user traction early on? So, Would you care to comment on how do you have users to, even if you have a not an MVP, a more mature product, how you get your early users on your community? Go on to existing community. As a, I, my mm, background experience is as a social media manager for, uh, for Bitdefender. Uh, one thing I learned there is that the communities, not necessarily your community, the security communities out there, the tech communities, are a powerful power, are a powerful thing. And if you go out there and uh, reach out with your product, with your ideas, uh, they will help you. Um, and uh, I, I got, because in, inside the Defender we, uh, we had uh, the same for Heimler. Uh, we had different new products launched. And we, uh, for different new products, I mean dedicated, for example, for mobile. Or, uh, for iOS or for Android, and I, I, uh, my job was to go into communities and get user traction. And uh, if you show that you're really passionate about your product and that your product fulfills a need, and if you show that you're really listening to the user's feedback, uh, it's impossible not to get traction. Okay, but these are some basic things that most startups don't do, from my perspective. Speaking on the user acquisition, I just want is like an anecdote because this is really one of the top moments to develop a startup in, in security and privacy. You all know the Snowden case, the NSA scandal, and so on. Yeah, do you know the search engine DuckDuckGo, for example? And probably now you know more. Well, DuckDuckGo has been existing, I think, for six, seven years. And for those who don't know it, it's a search engine uh, American company been there for six, seven years. Search engine doesn't provide user. They make money out of advertising only with the keywords. So they do not track clicks, they do not profile user, which is what actually Google to do does. So when the, it came out, the NSA was uh, basically <laughs> monitoring everyone, and the big company were helping them. The day itself, or the day after, uh, DuckDuckGo had an exponential growth. It was like, I don't know how many millions uh, people more on the day after. And now, if, uh, if you know, uh, DuckDuckGo is offered as one of the um, default search engine in the new Apple operating system, which is going to bring even more users. So we, this is something that leads us to, to say, and also now I'm reading even more news about privacy and security. If you're really thinking to enter the market, probably now is the time to get uh, consumers' attention. They're more aware of what is out there. And uh, 
besides the like the story I didn't know about the NSA Google uh, Google Earth. But for personally, for example, I started switching off of many products which do not comply with minimum privacy and security. So I, I'm obviously a bit like early adopter user, but if I didn't know one year ago, you bet more people now know as well. So if you want to enter, this is the moment. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, I think that there are different levels also of consideration here. One is the typical development chain, the value generation chain, from your ideas on alpha to a beta and then to the MVP and then out to the market. And the, here, especially in the security and trust area, the certification is a very important point. I absolutely agree. Uh, but it's also very important that before you add the alpha version, exactly have an idea what kind of additional services you offer with your product, how to accomplish the maintenance, how, what kind of first level support you have to offer, and so on and so on. This is absolutely important. And you need this user feedback in this stage. Uh, and I think there is an important remark to make. Uh, the EU is aware of this phenomenon. And the EU sponsors a lot of activities for user-centric approaches, for user-centered product development for early stage companies or startup companies. I don't know if you have heard about it, but there is a platform where you can get free services, feedback from user community. The name of the platform is Lila, L-I-L-A. It's, a, I think, lilaproject.eu, where you can apply. And uh, if you are accepted as a startup company to be coached by the EU, you get free users' feedback uh, uh, organization services. Which, what does it mean? You have the chance to get a need assessment uh, for free from experts. They will discuss with you what is your ideal user community. And they will set up user feedback sessions with the defined user community. The feedback session can be purely online in this platform so that you open your, your product or your uh, application for free testing to a defined user community. All the user feedback can come in an organized event to which you, for example, invite 10, 15 companies which could be target customers for, of the future. So you present the ideas in a very early stage to users and you get the user feedback. <coughs> this does not cost you anything. Maybe travel costs if you go to the event. This is all for free, this is all supported by the EU. I think it's important to know. Uh, and uh, there is a representative of an innovation GmbH in Germany. Uh, she is one of the bootstrappers of this platform, and you can directly talk to her if you want to have access to this platform. And actually what you need is just the idea, and then if the idea passes on, you'll have to, to build the MVP, of course, and go to user testing, which usually takes a lot of budget. Usually the first round of seeding would go to user testing, so this is very, very important. So, okay. Um, just just for the, how do we get <coughs> first users? I mean, it was for us kind, kind, kind of easy to do that, because um, we decided, you know, what, what do we do with the technology or what do we do with the idea we had? We said, okay, do we go business or do we go consumers? And we said, no, we don't go business because we would have never dropped it before we signed the first contract because we knew that. So you negotiate, you have to be compliance and use And users is it's quite quite simple. You just get a, get a website up up and running and you give your product away for free. That's it. I mean, we, we, we just established a free mail model. So we gave it away for free. And we found some media partners in Germany. We worked with Excel Springer with Computer Gold, so they put their, uh, the software on their on their CD. So on the next day, we had I don't know 80,000 uh, users in the service, and that was that was the way we we, we, we uh, got got first traction. And um, regarding the story of Dr. Go and Edward Snowden, I, I agree on the fact. I mean, if you want to run a privacy or security company, now is the time. Um, but I highly doubt that Dr. Go will be successful in the long run because it's it's an American it's an American company. And you, and you basically can't run privacy-related products in the US. And this is intentional, a huge change for all of us here in Europe. The first time in history we can build products, Americans can build. And we can't any longer complain about they have the money in the valley and we don't have it here in Europe, because we can build something here that they can't build. 
these people will not be able to build a product that is privacy related because the next day they bring it online they will get a national security letter and they will be forced to open their source codes and everything and build a bank code there. I run my company since four years here in, in Romania in the European Union, I never got a letter like that, I never got a, list, uh, a visit from an attorney, I never uh, from a state attorney, from the police or something that forced us to hand over data or something like that. We have a really very well developed privacy culture in Europe, uh, we have a very well developed privacy culture in Eastern Europe, especially because of the history, and in Germany also because of the history there. So I think these all together can be a huge chance for us to build big sustainable privacy companies and kick some Silicon Valley risk. Okay. Okay, so privacy culture is our main advantage. Are there any other advantages or opportunities related to security products? Especially in Europe? Especially in Europe. I, I, think, I think indeed uh, that we have a cultural advantage in Europe uh, uh, regarding privacy. People, people have a high, um, high privacy standards here. We have, we have uh, uh, the, the laws. And I think um, um, we have the possibility to build especially uh, based on these uh, technology tech, tech companies, I mean, have a look on the on the old industry landscape. Um, uh, we have Bitdefender; it's a Romanian company. We have Kaspersky; it's a Russian company. We have AVG; it's a Czech company. So all these big old security companies are Eastern European or European companies. We have Avira in Germany, big companies, stuff like that. So we have also a technical culture of building security products. And these all together should, should lead us really to a, to a point that we should found more and more and more help of these companies. And the challenges are huge. I mean, if we want to have a secure internet in the future, and if we want to have privacy in the future, we all know the solution. I mean, it's obvious, and the solution is encryption. But to build that, we need, first of all, something like what we build. So we, we, we need something that hides metadata, so that nobody knows who is communicating with whom. That's how you ensure privacy. And we have to encrypt the content. That means we have to encrypt messaging, email, stuff like that. And there are a lot of starts up, startups working on that right now. So, and, and, and we are right now working on the, on, the, on the basement of it. So there's enough space and a lot of room for, for, for ideas. I mean, we had, a, we had a, a, a very interesting startup a couple of months ago. It's, it's called Secret. This, this application is, is doing nothing else than that, that you can share a sheep secret by hiding your metadata. I mean, our developers could, could implement something like that in, in, in two days in our service. We, we simply don't do that uh, because we focus on building our, our, our own, own internet infrastructure. But that's what people can build on top of what we build in future. So there are huge opportunities. And we already built an API. It's, it's ready and open. So if people want to build something on top of our, of our API, they are, they are, they are welcome to do that. So if somebody wants to have an encrypted messaging tool, build it on top of our API. We have everything ready, servers, uh, a login system, a billing system, everything is there. Uh, hiding metadata is not a problem because we already have it. And I think that's a huge, huge, huge opportunity for, for Europe and especially, I think, for Eastern Europe because of the, the high, uh, uh, high amount of, of, of tenants here. So, also I would agree with you that we have a very nice tradition in developing strong security solution. This is a little bit long ago, so 10 years ago, because uh, we, I would add to your list also Romanian antivirus, which was sold to Microsoft, which is yeah, Otto Georgescu's company, a, a big success. But actually, uh, the exit from the last 12 months are mostly software as a service. So no user-based uh, services, um, with market change, we see some very strong security companies coming out from this space, Europe or East Europe, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, look at us, we're doing fine. I mean, yes. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I strongly believe that there's a huge market. I mean, that's, that's what, we, what, what, we are, what we have been discussing as we build this company. I mean, you, we didn't want to be behind a small market, so we want to be behind a big market. So, and a big market is, is, is necessarily everybody who's connected with these devices to the internet. So we want to protect people. And if you have a look on the, on the international landscape, you have 800 million people paying for antivirus subscriptions. But an antivirus subscription is simply not enough. So then you have 200 million people living in countries where you have clear censorship, where you need a two guy calls. And you have additionally 400 million people living on this planet somewhere as expats. They need access to their, their home country. So if we talk about 1.6 billion people who now could use our service. 
So like, uh, as I said, we have now 3 million uh, uh, users and, and 600,000 uh, a day. So we are here and the market is there. So I don't even think about, you know, what we can build. I mean, we can build a huge, a huge company. Okay. And I think others can do the same. If you talk about emailing, messaging, all that is privacy related, sharing files online, uh, exchanging of pictures. Uh, we have a startup here at the Tech Hub at the last MVP Academy. Three guys, they're accepted now to an accelerator to London. They're, 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 they're dealing with how can you share your pictures private with your friends and not on a Facebook page. I mean, that's a small idea, but all of these ideas have, uh, have for sure a, a huge future. So anything you'd like to add about the opportunities specific to Europe? Do we have a competitive advantage against other markets, other economies? Do you think so? I think uh, the, the security market is an outstanding market in Europe. Uh, there are many, many reasons in addition to what you already mentioned. Uh, one is, everybody knows internet applications are growing exponentially. Yeah, and uh, by definition, this means security. So this de defines one market. Uh, secondly, uh, the European, the general European policy targets service-oriented business. Yeah, we are again in the security area. The goal of the EU is to support the service economy in Europe. We want to distinguish from China and Japan, who are, have advantages in cheap cost, low cost uh, production manufacturing, and we want to distinguish from the US. This is why we build in services. And many companies which invented originally a watermarking uh, algorithm now orient themselves to service business. Now, they print passports from, for the Ukraine government, but they deliver the service. They build the hardware, yeah, they put the equipment together, they install their algorithms, and they deliver the full equipment and print the service the passports even. Yeah, so it's full service package. This is supported and this is demanded. Supported means you get funds from the European Commission to prepare this kind of businesses. And demanded means the customers go for this. And uh, another good reason, uh, reason to be, to focus with security in the European market is uh, that uh, this is an orthogonal technology area. It fits to many, many other business segments. Just to give one keyword, brand protection. All these big brand producers today, maybe textile brands, uh, uh, they, like Boss or others, they have to protect their brand. And you know that there's a big stealing going on and uh, copying of brands. You have to do the authentication, you have to follow up where does my brand go. This all is accomplished by watermarking algorithms, for example. This is security application, this is security market. And suddenly, security is a big enabler in the textile market. This is our challenge. Not only this is the opportunity in Europe from my point of view. Okay, so this is, this is an open panel. I think we should take some questions from the public. So. I, I so. could add uh, my answer to, to the Europe thing. Yeah, I think uh, one thing we should take into consideration is that people uh, we have way better, from my experience, way better um, professionals inside the security industry than we have in the US. Uh, for example, we have uh, great virus analysts in Germany, in Romania, in uh, Russia. Uh, just take uh, just take the antivirus product. Until, two, until three, four years ago, Norton and Trend Micro, Norton, I mean Simon Tech and Trend Micro were the leaders. They're not anymore. Uh, because they they lag uh, behind the the technology, they cannot keep up with the cyber criminals attempts, with the, the new malware that's out there. They they don't invest in the labs anymore so much. They were marketing companies, not technology companies. And uh, the companies that invested into the, in the in people, in technical people, in good in good labs in technology, like defender like uh, Kaspersky. Uh, now have the uh, now have the, um, the upper hand. If Norton, for example, even declined to two weeks ago 
to participate in independent testing uh, from uh, AB comparatives, I think, or AB test, because they 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 are weak. They have very very poor results. And we need to maybe the European market, the European and diverse market, should focus more on growing the idea in the users for the users that the 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 US based security products are weak in this moment. At least on the virus. Okay. So questions. Would you like to know anything about how does okay? I was wondering what's the IT strategy? Let's say that uh, tomorrow uh, NSA is going to knock on your door and uh, you're going to need to have such a strategy. Uh, what if uh, you're asked to give your source to them or something? What are you going to do then? So first first of all, the, the NSA will not knock at our door. We are in Romania. <laughs> so <laughs> it would <laughs> work. <laughs> I, 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 I would, would invite them to coffee and, yeah. and you know, I don't, I don't mind. Um, no, but I understand the question. If, if, if this would, would, would happen, I mean, we have then two possibilities. I mean, so, no, st starting with the first one. Uh, CyberOS doesn't operate outside the law. So if, if we would have a, a, a court file and we had to hand over data to a court, um, we would uh, have been forced to do it. So, so we, we, we have to do that. But the point is, we don't store data. So CyberOS is, 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 is one of the companies that prove that you can make money with no data. You know, all the big companies out there, they make money with data of customers, we make money with protecting data by not storing it. So we have nothing, so we can hand over nothing. So if we have to build a backdoor, I have two possibilities. Either I shut down my service, which I would do, or I would move the company to a, to a country where I have another legislation. I did that before, so I came from Germany to Romania because of the, the better legislation here. Romania has a long tradition of, of uh, 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 privacy protection. The Romanian um, Constitutional Court was one of the first courts in the European Union to decline the data retention law in the European Union. The European Union fought, followed later on. So it was a very, a very a positive climate here regarding privacy. I think it will, it will stay like that. But I will really, because I, I believe in what I do, um, I want to change the world, and I, make, I want to make some money out of it, but the first two reasons are more important for me, so I would, I would rather shut down the service or move. But I guess you have also some restriction on the algorithms for uh, encryption that you use, like uh, the keys are on that many number of bits. You can't just uh, be too secure about it, right? There are some regulations. No, that, no. I, th I think our, our encryption technology is, is, is safe. That's not the, the, the point where they will attack us. Um, uh, we have 256-bit encryption. I don't, I don't think that anyone can, can break that down right now. Also, also, ex <laughs> also experts say that. No, no, we have other issues. Um, I mean, um, people, people can be forced you know, to hand over data uh, as a person. Uh, hardware can be compromised. I mean, what we know from the NSA is not only that they're building these, these, these men, they also infiltrated hardware. So what we are doing right now uh, is realizing that we are not only a software company, we are a hardware company. Um, so we are running servers, you know, and these servers can be infiltrated. They can be physically attached. So somebody can, can simply go to one of our data centers, knock, knock at the door, and, and, and put the hardware device there. So these are the points we are discussing right now to protect our users. So, and what we always tell them, look, we, we can't guarantee you that CyberGhost protects you 100% against mass surveillance, because it's not possible. But what we can make sure is if you don't use it, you will be for sure 100% surveilled. So you should simply you know, go that step and use our product, knowing that it might not be 100% safe. Okay. How do you see the Romanian market for security products and services? We have users. Um, we have paying users from Romania. Yeah, I don't. Have pain. Pain. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. 0.5 percent. I don't know. <laughs> but we are running the service in two other countries. So Romania is a small country. It's not only the, the, the national market. Simply, if you run an international business, not many customers will be from Romania. Uh, so basically, the, the malware market is like this. The malware market changed a lot in the last years. So. The malware creators are not focusing now on breaking things, on destroying your PC, on destroying your files. 
they are just out there to get your data or financial data, credit card numbers and things like that. And from that perspective, Romania is not a very good market because for security products. Because people, the Romanian market still needs to adapt to online banking, to do online transactions. Uh, the, the percentage of people that do that is very small and uh, uh, the need for a security product for that, from my perspective, my, at least for my product, it's, a, it's very, 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 very small. Uh, and I don't see it, it will be, the, the, the climate will change for sure, but um, currently it's not the market for my security. So I wonder what's the cost for security? Because essentially security comes against evolution because every user wants to have fine bits on his screen, right? You want to have an application that runs and security usually comes against that because then you cannot have whatever feature because it needs to go to whatever server that is in the US or then you, don't, you cannot, uh, if for example I talk with Amazon uh, they had this nano service attack, and then they said, yeah, we just pay you, and that's it, right? We just sign a contract, we don't care about security because we don't want to do 2,000 firewalls against us. So what's the cost of security? I mean, how, how do you see that? When do you uh, say, okay, I don't pay, the, I, I can pay that much for security, uh, this is too much, uh, I go for, for usability, and yeah, who cares about security? Yeah, I mean, if we talk about security in the in the future, it has to be simply built in everywhere. So what we have right now is, is a world, that's why I say the internet is broken. And exactly that's what you said, the whole shit doesn't work anymore. And, and we just fix it, you know, what we, what we need. Yeah, but where do you buy a hardware phone, for example? They are not manufactured here in, in, in EU, right? They are probably in China or whatever. Yeah, ex exactly, this is the next challenge. We, we, we are right now building our own data center. So we are writing, we are writing. You have your uh, design product, uh, design hardware because you can have flaws or vulnerabilities in your chipset. Exactly, we know that, but but you know, to, to, to start working on own hardware, we have to have our own data center. You know, we have to have the technology here in our office. So that's simply the next step. So what, I, I, don't, I don't say that we will build this in the next five years. We will build this maybe in the next 10 years, or we will build it because it has to be built. We have to. Reboot the internet. So who is we? Our company. So or, 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 the whole, or the whole security so, industry. So we have to company should, should build their own hardware and software stack, everything? No, we should build in security in all the products. If I roll out a product in our days, it has to have built-in security. If I have a messenger, a, mess a, a, a service, an e-commerce uh, shop, if I run a, I don't know, whatever, a campsite, whatever, it has to have built-in security end-to-end -end encryption, uh, 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 security for the for the users and stuff like that, and it will be for sure like that. Yeah, yeah, with, with that I agree. But uh, when you say security, how do you how do you measure that? I mean, do you take a standard from wherever it comes and say, okay, we we uh, we we do that whatever they say in the standard, and we have built in security because it has been proven that standards are broken. It's actually the case that there are keys out there. Uh, and standards that have been proven formally that they're secure, and then all of a sudden, oops, there is also master key that can they have access to it. <laughs> yeah, I, agree. I agree. So three things have to change. Uh, first, the technical basis of what we talk about. Yeah. So this has to change. Uh, but <coughs> there we hope you know there is this program. Uh, there are companies like ours. There are other startups to to work on that. So it's a technical challenge. We will try to solve it. So th this is one part that has to change. Second part that has to change is um, um, uh, politics around us. So I mean, politicians have to, have to support that. It makes no sense that we build brilliant technology and stupid politicians break it down on purpose <laughs> by building backdoors that their secret services have access to it. I mean, I mean th this is, this is, what we face right now is the so-called failed state. A state always fails when he's no longer able to protect the people living in this state. And I'm feeling living in, in, in a country like Germany or Romania where I'm not protected by my government because they don't understand that they, that, they, that they destroy a brilliant technology by purpose. So this has to change. It's also a political question. And third, people have to change. I mean, we all use the internet for free and we take it for granted. Like we use Google for free and we use Facebook for free and we'll think the internet is free. It's all free. 
So, and what we don't realize is that we pay with our data. We pay a fucking high price with our personal data to access these services. So what has to change is that people are aware of the fact that privacy costs money and that they have to pay for it. So in future, they have to pay for the services they use. We, we have been running a campaign last year. We named it Diverse of Privacy, and we said, we sell now our premium service for whatever price people want to pay. And they could pay one euro or 100. And we said, OK, let's find out what's the verse of privacy is right now. And people paid in average 7 euro 49. So that's what the verse of privacy is right now, 7 euro 49. <laughs> and um, we will run the campaign this year again, and we'll see if this price drops. Because I think this is really <coughs> the question. What are people willing to pay for security? Uh, yeah, I'd like to come back to it. Uh, you have earlier stated that the importance of starting a new startup company is patent protection, right? But I'm asking you, with your startup, would you be willing to share your patent in order with other security companies in order to build a better security overall? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. So then again, here comes the problem. <coughs> the main problem with innovation and uh, alternatives to like the U.S. chips and uh, U and uh, China chips and the RFCs for the internet and all everything like that is the problem that they're all patent protected. Like Cisco owns like I don't know large sum of it. Then you have Intel. Then you have Texas Instruments. Then you have all these sum of companies which basically control the whole electronic industry. Uh, what do you see that the European Union or the uh, IT companies in the European Union, from hardware manufacturers to to software developers, can do in order to maybe uh, Let's say change this and uh, come up with new uh, with new products that work the same and are compatible, but they do not break any patents. I mean, obviously, this is something on a very deep political level. And uh, what would your advice be for uh, politicians, and how would you try and convince them for the importance of open patents, while also arguing for the importance of uh, protection of own ideas so other companies don't come in and just abuse your ideas and make money off your good ideas without, with no interest of sharing that revenue. I, I mean, I have, as you said, it's a, it's a deep political question. So I'm not a, a friend of, of, of patent rights and, and, and I, I don't believe in, 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 in that it protects the value you build as a company. Um, and it's, I think, one of the huge blockers we have regarding you know, innovation, indeed. I mean, we all would move faster, you know, if, 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 if uh, knowledge uh, would be accessible. I'm not talking about us here in the, in the rich parts of the world. I'm talking about, you know, poor countries who are taken, taken away from, 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 from accessing our technology. That's, that's the game they play at the end. So, but that's just a political uh, thing. Um, when, it, when it comes to how, how would I deal as, as, a, as a company with my internal knowledge, um, we don't try to protect anything we know when it when it doesn't cause um, security leaks. So we are trying to be as much as transparent as possible. So we invite, for example, NGOs to our headquarters to have a look in our source code. We are not open source because I don't believe in the idea of open source because it doesn't make any any, any big difference. Um, we invite people to look at our source code. We invite uh, 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 the in certification processes. We uh, have transparency reports, so we are as transparent. As possible, um, and I believe you know that that the value of our company mm -hmm. is our company culture and our team, and nobody can copy my team. Mm -hmm. So and we will always kick their asses because we are amazing. <laughs> Quick question: You just made a comment that open source. <laughs> but what I'm saying is security is one of the areas where open source really is something to the table. Like the openness itself of uh, hardware uh, is the would now have been found if it was not open source. Yeah, but that's that's exactly the, the, the proof that that open source is not the guarantee that you don't have problems like that. I mean it's not about if the source code is open or closed, it's about how you deal with the source code. Do you have enough people who are constantly working on the source code finding these bugs? And here we are at the, at the certification process. Open source lacks one thing, and this is financing. So if, if open source would be financed proper, and, and, and we could pay people, pay experts, to, to review these codes, I would, I would trust it. But I rather trust my, my source code, because I pay experts to, to review the code constantly. 
So we have people building the code and we have people reviewing the code. And in open source, you are just the people who build the code. And sometimes they stick around and find some backdoors. Open source, is, it's, a, it's a brilliant thing. I mean, it's also good, good for innovation. But please don't argue that it's, it's more safe. Well, but the fact that it doesn't guarantee anything doesn't mean that it doesn't really take. It will be the same way of saying that the fact that we can guarantee privacy means that we don't bring anything up to privacy. And uh, the issue is, you know, if open sourcing something has zero cost to you, if you not worth saying that you should adopt open source projects because they're safer. But the fact that if open sourcing a large chunk of your code has zero cost to you, if you're still doing all the work, and this has the value of bringing, let's say, an extra 1%, an extra 0.5% of privacy code is, why would you not? Why would you do not want that extra 0.5, that extra 1% of eyeballs looking at you? I mean, we, we, are, we are discussing right now internally to, to, to go open source with parts of our, our code. Uh, but this is a strategic decision because we can move faster if the code is open because more people can build something on top of it and we can learn from it. So that's the reason why you should go open source. To, to innovate a process. I, I think open source shouldn't be a religion, just you know, go open source and that's the only way to go. So closed source makes sense. I mean, we don't want to publish core parts of our, our code because we don't want to you know, invite the NSA to, 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 to hack us. I mean, uh, that's simply not what we want to do. But in, in, in some parts of the code, we're thinking to go, to go open source with it because it, it, it helps us to innovate faster. And it might help other people to, to learn. And cores of uh, parts of our technology technology are already open source. We use OpenVPN and stuff like that. You're saying that you don't want to open source parts of your code because you don't want to invite and say to hackers, isn't that saying that part of your thing is security or obscure? No, that means that, that part that part of the things we, we build is is simply something that has not to be published. So we can invite at all of people, trustful people to have a look on our source code, but we won't publish it. So, uh, we'll take two more questions, please. Uh, okay, uh, this is the second part of my first question. Uh, can you tell us uh, what are the top three countries uh, for your products as the number of customers and revenue? I don't know, if, I will not give up numbers and not, I, don't, I don't know if my CEO allows me to. I will tell the top three countries. It's uh, Denmark, the home country for my company. Uh, it's uh, Sweden and the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, for us, it's Germany, USA, and number three, I'm not sure. I think UK, UK or France. But we have 220 countries. So, so, it's, so it's very interesting. So we have a free product and a premium product. So the premium stream comes from the so-called rich countries, Western, uh, Western countries and, and, and US, so where people can can afford uh, privacy, but we have a lot of uh, users from from um, the countries that suffer um, from dictatorships or from censorship. So we have a lot of North, uh, North Africa, um, Syria. Always when we have crisis, Turkey, for example, if they start to to, uh, to do something against uh, against uh, journalists there, and if they start to block Twitter again, our our Turkish user curve goes, goes higher. So uh, the, the the free one, um, yeah. But that's that's how they're there. I, I always say we offer a, a, a cool service to parts of the world where they really need it, and it's paid by the rich people who can afford it. It's kind of <laughs> so, uh, do you target those top three countries specifically, or they just came? No, they they, they they just came. So we are, you know, look. If you have a company with 30 people, you don't have country managers or something. Like that. <laughs> so we it's simply, you know, we have a, our website is in five languages, and we just throw it out, and uh, we don't know what we do. I don't know. So, so we are, but. What you want to know is what would we focus on if we would have the, the possibility to. So we would uh, we would be country managers and exactly focus the, the the companies where you can make the most money out of it. And, and this is for sure then uh, 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 Germany, UK, Italy, Spain, France, stuff like that, and then US. And that's it. And then go for the for the rest of the world. And for that, uh, hire country managers who know exactly the market there and go exact, especially on this market with special campaigns. I think you raised an important question, but uh, you should uh, turn this question back to you. What do you want to achieve with your idea or with your entrepreneurial career? And there are different visions. There are entrepreneurs who want to be sustainable entrepreneurs for their lifetime uh, with the same idea. 
get something, develop something which is cool, bring it out to the market and run the business forever. There's a second kind of entrepreneur who wants to get it out to the market, wants to find a partner, an investor, and follow the investor's philosophy to find an exit strategy to get rich. And the investor can be a financial investor, can be a corporate investor. And I think uh, if you look for a corporate investor or a financial investor, then you have to look, uh, in Europe you have to look uh, into the markets and, uh, uh, in Germany and France and uh, in the UK. These are the market that big uh, corporate players in the security area are. If you want to achieve this return on investment through an exit, then this has to be, uh, have to be your, your regional goal. Okay. So, last question. Last question is there. Okay. So, coming back to the previous topic of what the industry can do in Europe in order to improve, like Siemens or uh, Alcatel or all the European companies, would you have maybe some advice for some of the young oh, engineers yeah. here that would? would try and uh, present an idea to a big tech company in, um, in Europe and maybe convince them to, okay, you know, Intel makes Wi-Fi chips now. Why couldn't like Siemens make something like that? Or why wouldn't Siemens invest in something like the chip market where they already have some chips, they do, but like take a bigger leap, like make processors, make a uh, system on the chips and so on and so forth. So why is there no push in Europe to make our own hardware and to make our own software? Why, why, why do you think is that? I mean, or what can we do about it? Yeah, okay, I think uh, I talked already about the allocation of, uh, of the resources, uh, the world allocation of resources between US, Europe, and the uh, Far East. And uh, this makes somehow obvious that uh, European companies don't want to focus on hardware. There's one part uh, of, of a set of answers that could be given to your question. Uh, if you want to get access to Siemens or to the big players, to the Thomson of this world, to the Siemens of this world, uh, there is a process-oriented way to get access. Right? So you develop your idea, you further develop it into a prototype, you get the user feedback from the market, you start the acquisition process, and uh, somehow you find partners to introduce you at the right point of time to Siemens or to Thompson. Or you find ELT, ICT labs who have this established collaboration. Uh, if you don't want to go this institutional process, uh, then the best thing is to look what Siemens and, Thompsons are, and Thompson are doing right now. Where are the governmental purchases going into? What are the sectors? What are the market areas? What are the niches? So if Siemens, for example, is not building new departments, Siemens is always outsourcing. Yeah, and this technology accelerator of Siemens is a vehicle to outsource. They invest in startup companies in order to outsource their business to new technology-oriented firms. So if you look into Siemens uh, portfolio management, if you look into the, the annual reports of Siemens about the uh, midterm strategies as well in Thomson's and as well in the governments, like the Bundesdruckerei, for example, the, the printing uh, company, uh, printing uh, federal documents uh, for the German government, uh, then you know in which area they invest, then you know in which area they will outsource. Then you have good, if, you, if your product fits into this area, then you have a good reason to contact them directly and to find them the right persons in the organization. So, uh, the last part of the event would be a very short presentation yeah. of Idea Challenge. So, I think, right. so after the Mateo's presentation, I invite you to talk to the guests. Uh, please do not be shy. I think we... Yeah, yeah. the method is ready. Yeah, so basically, I, I'm going to the end. I don't know if the guy there can see it, but I'm going to the end because this is uh, the, the action item of this meeting of today. Basically, how do you enter the possibilities of, net, of business opportunities that all can explain, and how you get to be the next entrepreneur? So, precisely because the European Institute of Technology is um, is um, is a 
European Commission funded entity, the goal is to get entrepreneurs to uh, create businesses in Europe. So uh, again, uh, that's why one of the reasons we're here. So I'm not going to go again on what is the EIT because Wolfram did explain. But uh, the idea challenge basically is the, oh yeah, it's a bit tough. But the idea challenge is a program set up within the ATST labs to scout ideas so they don't need to be a startup already or a funded established company, but it can be uh, this year at least uh, also at the stage or you have a business idea that you would like to test and then you would like to, to go into the funnel and grow within the business development accelerator of the ATST labs. So this is the focus and that's why we set it up. Um, so first of all, just the requirements before we dig into what it is, uh, is close to EU citizens and the company has to be a startup or it doesn't have to be funded. So uh, founded uh, more than three years. So if you have a new company that would apply, I guess I don't know if there is no EU citizens here, but in case you have, uh, you can also have a mixed team of EU, non-EU, but the person applying has to be uh, EU based in order to get the grant. Uh, note, which I'm going to repeat the application run until the end of September. So, um, what we're giving out with this uh, competition, uh, the, we're going to select, um, this is the next slide, we're going to select uh, out of the ideas that we get in the eight topics that I'm going to explain to you, three, uh, ten finalists to come to uh, the final event for each of the topics. The top three will get 40k for the first one, 25 for the second one, and 50k for the third one. If you are just at the idea stage, this is more than enough to get some uh, testing going on. And this is all zero equity, precisely because we are a public uh, institution. So, but more than the cash, what you get is to access the BDA, meaning that. The, the winners will get coaching by the business developers like Wolfgang and help them grow their business in order to get to the partner. So this is the real value of the winning this competition. Uh, and also integrating with activities that we do you know, connect with research and technologies and, uh, and, and also the university and the network. And apart from this, also six months of free working space in one of the nodes of EATS and uh, The nodes now are growing, so I forgot some of those, but I'm coming from the Italian node from Trento. Trento is in the Alps. Um, then there is the, the Berlin node, then there is the London one, uh, Stockholm, Eindhoven, Helsinki, uh, Madrid, Paris, and oh, I forgot. Budapest, exactly, but uh, there's, there's no office offer for the Budapest one. Uh, so the other one, yes. Uh, so free office in a, in a co-located center with also companies working in there. Um, this is the information that we need when you submit. So these are the basic ones. The basic, if you run any other kind of startup weekend or business competition, we always ask the same idea. A focus, uh, an important one is uh, an important. A couple of important ones are how much does it fit the, the action line that you apply to. The action line is the topic. So privacy, security, and trust. Of course, if you just happen to have some security built in your product, but it's not the core business of it, it depends on the evaluator. But it has to be focused on that. But also, we're going to evaluate, evaluate a lot what is the impact of the price, meaning that. If you can really take advantage of uh, okay, the cash, but also uh, the opportunities of entering the fund. So this is something also we value a lot on your idea. So that's for to answer also the question on uh, the, the person there did before. Um, so um, why do we do cybersecurity uh, idea challenge from Trento? So Trento, I don't know how many of you know where it is and, and works in Trento. It's a really tiny city in the Alps, 100,000 people, but it hosts some uh, top-level uh, in Europe research centers, and also I just discovered today it was and founded one of those, uh, well, it was on the board of one of those years ago. Uh, there's, there are over 16 research centers, and there are um, the, the largest one is called FBK, is one of the top ranking in, in the, 
uh, the world of research centers in informatics. And with over 800 researchers in informatics. But specifically, there are uh, research units dedicated to cybersecurity. And they do a lot of uh, technology um, uh, services as well for big clients. They did something for NASA as well, so working on security. And so there's a lot of technology to tap into in Trento. And beside this, also other companies like Poste Italiane, which is the mailing uh, company of, the, of Italy. You know, they need to, the Post have a bank as well. So they, they beside the mailing system, they have a bank system, they have a payment system, they have mobiles. So obviously security is something they invest a lot and they're gonna open a research lab there on security. Beside that, there's also Telecom Italia, which is one of the major telco providers, is also uh, collocated there and working as well in security. So there are some top 10 companies working on, on this there. And the final event is on the 13th of November. Um, I think I missed some deadlines here, okay. No, this is an old presentation, unfortunately. Okay, <laughs> I forgot to include some slides. So, um, I'm gonna tell uh, what, what was in the slide if we're not here. We have four topics open right now. That's why you see in the everywhere, eight topics, eight cities, uh, one challenge. Because we had eight topics, four were closed in, in this, this uh, spring, and we have four running right now. So you can also apply to more than one, obviously. You're gonna get accepted in one of the four topics, but you can apply to four. The other ones are Internet of Things, Smart cities, smart energies, and in cyber security uh, and trust. And how does it work? If you apply, uh, you're gonna be. We're gonna evaluate the ideas and get back to you. If you're one of the ten selected by the end of October, uh, we're gonna invite the ten people to to Trento. There's gonna be a reimbursement of the travel cost, so this is covered. You then. We're gonna do on the day before pitch coaching, then there's the final, then we're gonna award the prize the month after. Um, so it's pretty fast, and then immediately you're gonna get into the business development accelerator. So I think I covered all the bases. Uh, if you go to ideachallenge.ieitictlabs.eu, you see all the information you need to know. I left there on the on the on the desk there's some flyers with all the basic information, so I invite you to take one if you're interested to have some uh, paper note. And if you have questions, I'm around here. Uh, for more. So yeah, we have the questions in private, so everyone interested in please contact any of the persons around. Uh, this is the first time when such a competition is run on security. This is yeah. very important, so you don't have to be afraid that will be very tough things that will compete against you. This is a very good opportunity in getting at least a feedback on, on your idea. Precisely, we, I want to stress the point that we are really looking into <coughs> ideas and fresh ideas. Uh, we don't really need companies at this stage. We just need people with good ideas to uh, help them grow. And I think here, I, I heard already some really good ideas. So maybe, maybe it's why two remarks yeah. at uh, from, from the experience of the idea challenge which is already closed. One remark is it's really easy to participate. Don't get scared by the tough technical deadline 30th of September. If you go to the website, you will see it's absolutely easy to fill the form. If you have your idea in mind, you will be able to fill the form and you will, you will be able to submit in a short period of time for all high quality documents. I'm absolutely sure about this. Secondly, the chance in uh, security and trust is absolutely high because most of the companies compete in urban life and mobility, smart energy systems, and so on and so on. And thirdly, the experience from the other competitions is the money is being paid absolutely fast if you win. It's not typical EU <laughs> administration. <laughs> Don't be scared by the fact that it's the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. I know that you know that the EU pays slowly. Or not at all. Yeah. <laughs> this is not true for EIT ICT labs. You get the fifth, first fifty percent of the award money immediately after you get the award. We're gonna give hundred percent because we have to close the budget by yeah, December. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before Christmas. Christmas. So yeah. the final is on November and we cannot afford to do two. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so it's even better. Yes. Even better. 
Yeah. Please speak. What's so, up? Let's thank the speakers and uh, stick around for the questions. <laughs> Tomorrow, call because tonight I think you can burn. I had no idea she was pregnant actually. It was, uh, <laughs> 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 <